you might have noticed recently on my channel, I've been reposting some of the videos that I've done over the past three years when I've done Halloween content as sort of the best of Professor Geek Halloween. Different years, I'll do different themes. Like one year, I was really ambitious and did a 31 days of Halloween. So every single day of the month of October had a had a review. And it was it was fun, but it was, man, it was time consuming. And that was back when my channel was, wasn't doing much at all, you know, so it was just a labor of love. I really do like the month that I did Monstober in which I put each week or the year rather each week of October was a, a look at a different monster archetype. And that was fun. I've already released, re-released the ghost story archetype and the vampire archetype. I'll re-release my boogeyman archetype video. When we did the werewolf week that year though, I never released a standalone werewolf archetype video because I think uh, the way that week ran, we ended up covering that material more in our live stream when we were doing office hours that time. So what I did was I ended up releasing a standalone werewolf recommendation video, which I will re-release that because I do like the, um, the I, I think I, I went into a good, you know, brief analysis about, um, about the werewolf archetype and, and some specific stories that a lot of people maybe not doesn't don't know about. So definitely going to, uh, to re-release that. But the, um, Jigawatt says, sorry, I just saw that Jigawatt says, cool shirt. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Ishii and Kat. They're uh, Zero One Publishing, publishing company. So yeah, representing Ishii and Kat there. So I did want to actually put together a standalone werewolf archetype video. With my busy schedule, though, I didn't really have time yet. So I thought maybe while people are getting this notification, while people are funneling in, I'll start this stream off by talking about the werewolf archetype. And then I can cut that out and I can start the stream just when I start the, the story reading. And then I'll go ahead and throw some images up to that werewolf archetype video uh, at some point tonight or tomorrow and maybe re-release that on Halloween day. So so uh, so the actual archetype video will be there. So you guys are are here for the, the trial run of the uh, of the speech of talking about the werewolf archetype, though. But whenever I talk about archetypes of monsters, I constantly get people saying the werewolf's my favorite, the werewolf's my favorite. And I get it because werewolf's kind of my favorite too <laughs> there's just something so so interesting about it and intriguing and it's it's interesting to talk about it. it's got a weird history not a weird history but an intricate history the werewolf at its core the werewolf archetype is about is a fear of the beast within it's a fear of the beast within everyone every single one of us and to really understand what that means you, you have to kind of understand a little bit of the psychoanalytic history of it you know, Freud, of course, and, and this is the dime store tour of, of Freudian and, and Jungian, you know, uh, psychoanalytics here. So so go read up on these if you want more info. I'm just giving you very, very brief synopsis, not doing them justice at all. But basically, Freud divided the human psyche into to three areas. He said, you've got the ego, which is your your the way you know yourself, who you know yourself to be. There's the superego, that whom you aspire to be. You know, the, what, what you wish you would do, the standards, the morals, the values, and so forth. And then there's your id, which is that which you repress. All of your appetites, your desires, your urges, which obviously just, you know, the basest of them all, which do need to be repressed and at least ordered and and uh, and, and self-controlled to, to, uh, to, to operate in a society, a civilized society, obviously. And this is where we're starting to get the idea of where this werewolf fear slash fascination comes from. It starts in that idea of the id. Now, Jung, Freud's student, went on to develop his own ideas about this. Rather than an id, you have a shadow. We'll talk about that first, and then we'll get to his unconscious and conscious and whatnot. But he said you have a shadow self. Rather than a part of yourself that you just need to repress at all costs, there's a dark part of yourself that if you were to just repress it, no questions asked, always repress it, it's going to break back into your life. It, it's uncontrollable. If you try to repress it, it will not be repressed. It will break into your life like a beast, like a wolf almost. It's You would almost literally become a werewolf in terms of your personality. Uh, that shadow, you can repress, 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 but if you do it too much, it's just going to take you, take you over at different times. And you see this with people who, who um, you know, for example, uh, religious uh, leaders or whatever in the media who are 100% repressive against everything remotely sexual in any way, shape, or form. Repressive to the point where, uh, 
you know, like, like a, like, you know, a glimpse of a woman's ankle is too much, you know, or something like that. I mean, just really, really repressive. Those are usually the individuals that their, their stories come out later about them meeting guys in the bathroom stalls or something like that, you know, uh, because they can, you can repress so much before that you, you, it's going to, to break forth that, that, uh, what you're trying to repress is going to break on and take hold of your life. And you can see this werewolf story kind of taking form there. Now, Jung said that what you should do then is start to incorporate parts of your shadow into your life in a useful, civilized way. Um, you know, for example, if you were, uh, you know, if, if you, so you would incorporate a little bit of your, your rage and your anger as, as the shadow self, incorporate that into your life in terms of areas you might need to be assertive. Are a little bit affirmative, you know, um, you know, assert, assert your authority in places, whether you're a teacher or a police officer, bouncer, whatever, you know, that's just one small example. So he said you, you need to start in, um, incorporating a little bit of the shadow into your life, else it will take you over. So we got that little bit of setup we'll come to in a second. But let's look at what Jung said as well about his divisions of the psyche. He said that we have a conscious, which is kind of like Freud's ego, just for the sake of argument here, uh, or for the sake of explaining things, you know, that's what you're conscious about. What I'm conscious of, I'm doing right now, who I conscious, who who I consciously am, you know, what I what I'm conscious of people thinking of me and so forth. Then you have your personal unconscious, which is what we would call a subconscious. You know, you can access things in your subconscious. And this is where uh, complexes come from, you know, uh certain traits, certain um attractions, certain uh uh, you know, things that you, you would kind of viscerally be against and whatnot from your subconscious. And this is experiences you've had or whatever uh, throughout your past. So this is um, the subconscious. Then Jung said, though, you also have a collective unconscious. So you have your personal unconscious, the subconscious, which you can access, but there's a collective unconscious, which is shared with all humanity. And that cannot be accessed directly because that's like our shared species memory. And within that collective unconscious, there exists what he called archetypes, which can never be directly accessed, but they do manifest in our lives and in our existence through symbols. So we have perhaps in dreams, and he said a little bit to this extent of in stories and whatnot, but these symbols we can read and we can try and get at an idea of the real archetype. So for an example of this would be like, Every human being, now you've got some crazy human beings who are just like, oh, I love snakes, you know, whatever. <laughs> but most human beings have sort of a, eh, let me get away from that reptile over there, you know. Uh, and even people who love, you're not supposed to want to go cuddle up to an alligator, right? You're not supposed to want to go kiss a snake because we're mammals. We're their prey. That's a hereditary memory for us. You know, that's part of our collective unconscious. and. It's it's a symbol of something even greater. You know, I'm just trying to make connections here with this. So we do have so many stories of the dragons, you know, and and you might look at like Asian cultures where the dragons are more benevolent, but there are also very different types of dragons as well. So you, you look at the, the specifics of where it's coming from. You can read the symbol and track the symbol all the way back as far as you can to the collective unconscious. OK, giving short shrift, but let's move to young student, Joseph Campbell, that we talk about a lot on this channel. Joseph Campbell, of course, developed the Jungian ideas into looking at how those archetypes manifest in our stories and our mythologies and so forth. And that's bringing us full circle now to the point of the, of the werewolf. So let's look at how the werewolf as an archetype has, has developed through our stories and myths. The werewolf or the wolf man, as we know him today, did not start off in, in that capacity. And not just in the sense, you know, like vampires, for example, they they evolved. You know, vampires at first were just sort of more like zombie creatures, the, the dead coming back to life to consume and feed on the living. And then they slowly progressed into this very Apollonian. And if you don't know that word Apollonian, I, I described that in my vampire archetype video that I just reposted a few days ago. But the idea of a very cognitive predator, not somebody who's prone to completely lose control. This is a predator. This is like a coyote or something like that. You know, a predator that is very uh, conscious of your moves, knows when to strike, knows how to how to uh, prey on you. And that's like some evolution. But the werewolf evolution was quite different. The werewolf archetype started from this visceral fear that we've had throughout our history of wolves specifically wolves, certainly of, of beasts in general, wild beasts in general. 
Now, if you're thinking about like some culture in Africa or something, sure, they might fear the lions more or whatever, you know, but any agricultural, um, you know, society, especially the ones in Europe, you know, where the, where the idea of the werewolf kind of really stemmed from, you know, their sheep and their flocks, they're going to worry about wolves at the time when wolves were still there, you know, when wolves were still uh, in, in, widely in North America, you know, it would have been a problem there as well. Wolves are the, the you know, kind of a primary predator in those areas. You know, they are the ones you have to worry about. There are no lions. There are no gorillas. You know, wolves are pretty much it in those uh, in those regions. So they're the ones you worry about. They're a prey. You know, they're, they're, um, are they're, they're a predator and, and you're their prey or your, your goods, your flocks are their prey or whatever. And then there started to be these stories of people who would change into a wolf. And sometimes they were witches. These were individuals, you know, in the stories who'd sold their soul to Satan or something like that. And they, uh, to get, to gain the power to be a skinwalker, to, to, to tra change into a wolf. And they would start to feed on babies in the village or something like that. You know, you have all these types of stories. Or are, are certain, uh, you know, Native American skinwalkers from more of like shaman style, uh, are just natives of any tribes, you know, different places around the world, like shaman-esque uh, curses or whatever you would find. But it started out with these were the these were the villains. These were um, people who had gone bad and literally became wolves. Quite literally in the story. So that's the first place where this fear comes from, this fear of a beast within. And you've got people who choose to embody and choose to embrace that beast. And we see that in culture. Right. And in our societies, people who choose to do very monstrous things, who just choose to be villainous, you know, uh, murderers, rapists, you know, whatever, people who choose to be horrible. So that's the first level of fear. The second level of fear and how you see these stories progress, though, is what if what if I can't control the beast of myself? What if I'm not embracing it? What if I'm not choosing to 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 embody this beast, but it just comes over me? I can't help it. Kind of like Jung would say when the shadow just breaks in and overtakes you. That's the real fear of the werewolf. And this is how the werewolf archetype in the werewolf, specifically that type of monster, branched off. It started out being just a skinwalker, like a witch or a vampire itself. You know, Dracula himself was able to turn himself into a wolf in the original novel and some of the original uh, books and whatnot. And that's the uh, it started with that. But the idea, the fear of the beast within the fear of not being able to control the own monster within myself, my own base urges, my own base for whatever that is, um, lust, revenge, rage, you know, any of that pride or whatever, that fear of being unable to control my own base urges, the monster within myself, you know, that is what pushes people to separate the werewolf from the vampire or from just a witch, because we really wanted to examine what, it, what that means. How can we overcome that? Let's deal with that societal anxiety we have about simply just not being able to contain the beast within ourselves. So that created the Wolfman as apart from Dracula or just a witch or skinwalker or something like that. And that's why we got, why we have the, the werewolf archetype. And it's a brilliant archetype. And it's interesting when you look at different stories, uh, you know, I, I, I love the classics where the Wolfman uh, is a curse, you know, it's because, because that's what it feels like, you know, for individuals who, who repress and repress and repress until it takes them over. And it doesn't have to be it takes over your life, you know, altogether. I mean, it can be in a moment. Let's say just for something simple. Let's say like uh, something you are um, somebody who doesn't like to lose control anger wise. OK, so when things make you angry, you just kind of swallow that. You're like, nope, I'm not going to lose control. I'm just going to swallow that. OK, we're fine. We're fine. But if you never have any outlet for that anger, then you are going to explode at some point on somebody. Probably not even somebody you're all that angry with. Just the person that happens to be there at, the, at that time that your anger needs to come out that's the werewolf coming out of you. You know, that's, that's the idea in real life, practical life. So these stories about a wolf man or a werewolf or whatever, they, they embody that anxiety or that desire to, to consider that, to analyze that and see how we can, we can avoid it and so forth. It's interesting that wolf in particular being the symbol of the beast has evolved. You know, it did start out with people becoming literal wolves, but it's funny if you watch the movies today where, it's somebody who becomes a literal wolf. It's not all that scary. Now, wolves are terrifying in the wilderness. But when you think about the monster movies that we have, somebody turning into a wolf, just a literal wolf, they just look like this little skinny dog. 
And I don't mean little wolves are actually quite big. Like, again, if you face a wolf right face to face, they're terrifying. Don't get me wrong. But on the screen, in context of the culture, in context of the monsters, cinematic monsters that we have, just somebody turning into a dog isn't isn't all that scary to us, you know? So you see that evolve cinematically to where it became a wolf man. Now, that's terrifying. Because that's uncanny. Now we're getting into the uncanny, which causes even more fear and discomfort to us. Lon Chaney Jr., uh, a man walking upright, yet very canine-like, wolf-like. You know, That's terrifying. That's not just an animal preying on you. Because an animal preying on you is terrifying, but there's no malice there. That's just nature taking its course. The animal's hungry. You're its prey. It's terrifying. But it's not the same thing as a human being. It wants to cause you pain, that glories and joys in causing you pain. That's far more terrifying. And, and that's what's blended in there when you get the idea of the wolf man. And cinematically, you see that become even more so in, in characters, you know, whether you look at Werewolf of London or um or Underworld. I love the wolf, the werewolves of Underworld, the uh, effects they had with that, these big, overgrown, huge, you know, upright wolf-like creatures. They were monstrous, they're terrifying. That's what's so fascinating about the werewolf. And I think that's why so much, so many of us are, are drawn to them because it's, it's in some ways, it's very Dionysian, like I said, you know, so as opposed to the vampire that's very Apollonian, who's, who's got his faculties, he's a, he's a predator, he's a cognitive predator. The werewolf's completely Dionysian. The werewolf takes you over. It's completely instinct, urge, rage, lust, whatever it is, depending on the story. And, uh, and, and that's, that's though, it's actually a more widespread practical problem that people have to deal with some people obviously have to make sure they're not being cognitive predators you know they are given to that kind of evil or narcissism or, or whatever sociopath or whatever but more people across the board have to make sure they're keeping control of their base urges their id their shadow whatever you want to call it but making sure they don't repress it to the point to where it's just going to bust out anyway they do have to incorporate all of themselves to be an integrated whole human being so it's fascinating. I love the werewolf story because of that. And and uh, you can tell so many different stories have, have delved into different aspects, different relations between the affected person and the wolf, you know, in within them. Of course, we have different shades of that. And stories like uh, Jekyll and Hyde or the Incredible Hulk. You know, you can you can expand it out in different ways where you've got the the werewolf archetype losing the idea of a wolf, but still very much the same concept. And even sometimes being a hero, you know, or some element or whatever, or, or that's a great idea. When, when Banner's able to integrate the Hulk into the Avengers teamwork, I mean, that's, that's integrating the shadow self. It's brilliant, you know, and it's not, that is not what he did with the professor Hulk. I just want to point that out. That's, that's killing off the shadow. And, and, and if that was a psychologically realistic tale, the Hulk would still have to reassert himself and take over Professor Hulk, um, which is why I hate that concept of Professor Hulk anyway. But anyway, uh, yeah, werewolves. Great. They're good stuff. That's why you're so drawn to them, perhaps. Uh, it's certainly things you should think about when you're writing their stories. You know, definitely things to think about if you're writing any kind of werewolf story, whether you're writing an actual werewolf or a character who does become some sort of monstrous being, you know, same kind of archetype.